are related to COVID-19 health concerns affecting the state and the city, the mayor has determined that an in-person meeting at City Hall with all participants may not be practical or prudent. Older persons and staff may not all be physically present at City Hall due to the disaster and attendance may be limited. To participate remotely during the public comment or public hearing portion of the meeting, please join by phone at 1-304-512-0024, pin 807 pound Thank you very much. Roll call. Alderperson Robinson. Hurt. Gilbert. Present. Swanson. Here. Parker. Here. Here. Healy. Here. And Mayor Tomes. Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Public comment. Is there anybody here? No, nope, nothing. Nobody signed up. Anybody virtual for public comment? Virtual? Hearing none. Seeing none. We will move on to the first item city software. Who is. Uh, Tim's going to kick it oh, going to do it. There we go. That makes sense. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, everyone, for a few minutes to talk about an exciting new project the city's working on. That is the new city software project. Um, we're going to use the acronym ERP, and later during our presentation, Plant Moran, our partner in this project, will help explain what ERP means. In a nutshell, it's the financial software. And so what I'd like to do is just take a minute to introduce Plant Moran. They are our partners in this process. What we determined early on as a team was we were going to need some outside help. It's a big job. There are a lot of moving parts, a lot of variables. A lot of question marks about how to go about doing this project. And so it was necessary to acquire some knowledge we don't have, time we don't have, and, and bring another partner in to help us. And so with that, I'd, go, I'd like to go ahead and introduce Plant Moran. I'll bring them up on the screen here. Nina, are you there? I am here. Are you able to hear me? Yes. Hi, good evening, everyone. And thank you, Tim, for the wonderful introduction. I am Nina Rajcevic. I'm a manager here with our Plant Moran team. Um, we'll introduce our team here and our firm here in a moment, but I'm also joined by Natalie Schwartz, who is the project director for the project. And we have a, a short presentation just to introduce um, what we are doing with the city on this important project. So I'm going to share my screen. Tim, if you could just give me a thumbs up once you're able to see it. <laughs> okay, wonderful. So we're here to introduce this ERP project and it's a really exciting time. Um, so we'll introduce who's working on it, what an ERP actually is and what the approach to finding the next ERP is, as well as talk about some next steps and questions. And so um, with that, just a quick introduction of our project team. As I mentioned, I'm Nina, I'm the project manager. And I was actually on site last week with Adam Ben Mosh, who's the project consultant and we were doing some initial meetings with some of the departments and the human resources group, um, as well as the community, develop, community and economic development area. So we're continuing interviews this week with the rest of our subject matter experts that I'll let, you, let Natalie introduce as she introduces herself. So Natalie, I'll pass it to you. Hey, thanks. And hello, everyone. Thank you for being with us today to talk about this project, as Nina mentioned, and I know we've talked with the city team and being really excited about this project. It is a, a high touch project. Everybody is going to be involved uh, within the city and it really impacts everybody. Um, and then by the end of it, we are confident that you all will really be happy with what you select and, and, and um, implement. So my name is Ali Schwarz. I am your project director. I will be supporting Nina and the rest of the team you see here to ensure you have the right resources engaged at the right time in the project and also bring some lessons learned from working on similar projects in Illinois and across the U.S. I've been in consulting, technology consulting for about 14 years and I've been with Plant for about eight. I do lead our Chicago um, public sector practice and we, myself and the others on this project team have uh, solely focus on public sector. So we are working with government clients 24 seven, like yourselves. I won't rattle off all of these names, but as you can see, we have a team of experts on your project team that really aligns with the city's business processes and the scope areas of the project. So financials, HCM payroll, utility billing, 
community development and kind of all of what falls under that. We've got experts in these areas and a lot of them actually come from um, the industry. So Mike Blickon came from Milwaukee County. Um, he's been doing HCM payroll consulting and system uh, implementations for gosh, 25 plus years. Caroline Glass came from um, from a city in community development. So we've really got a, a good group of a good group of people here to help you with the project. Um, and if you can go to the next slide, Mina, if if you aren't familiar with Plant Moran, we are an audit tax and consulting firm with about 3,300 staff, and we have offices in Illinois and surrounding Midwest region as well as Denver. But we have experts all over the U.S., and we've been serving government clients not personally, but nationwide for over 50 years. Next slide. So this is um, a list of a few of our clients we've worked with recently on an ERP replacement and or implementation project, just like the city's undergoing today. And we're still actually working with the village of Montgomery. Nina is also their plan, uh, project manager on that one. And they're very somewhat similar um, in demographics and size. You all are a little bit bigger, but that's a really good kind of benchmark to kind of understand what we will be looking at in terms of potential vendor proposals that we may see, as well as costs. So we can definitely, as we you know, get through the, the right um, procurement phases, um, discuss with you what we've seen there. And then all these other Illinois clients, we've actually, they've actually either selected a software already or they've, and they've implemented the software or they're done with implementation. So. Any of the questions you have on any of these projects, um, we'll try to answer the best we can, or we'll follow up with other folks that have worked on these projects. But you know, really, we want to bring kind of those lessons learned that we've we've um, seen on other projects to this project to help you with your your decision. Um, we are completely vendor independent. We do not partner with the vendor or sell software. We're very immersed, though, in the public sector software and marketplace. We do have a vendor liaison program where we meet with ERP vendors on a regular cadence to discuss new software capabilities that they have, service offerings, what are some of the trends and challenges we're seeing at our clients to ultimately collaborate better on how we can better serve clients and how they can better serve um, clients. There's a lot of things that, especially in the government practice, there's continually, um, you know, regs and requirements that are changing the way that you do business. And it's really important that uh, the vendors stay up, up to date on that. As mentioned, the ERP and historically was, you know, really looked at as a financial system, but really what ERP enterprise resource planning is today is a suite of integrated applications that use a common database to share information citywide across all departments and historically maybe 15 20 years ago this was really focused on financials but now the market has really changed to incorporate not only just financials but hcm human capital management and payroll um, as well as some other areas that are pertinent to the city like a utility billing or um, community development areas like permits or licensing or code enforcement. And so there's kind of a, a, a range of uh, ERP softwares out there that do it all. And there's some that do financials and HCM and payroll, and then kind of best of breed softwares that do some of those other applications. And you really can, you know, kind of look at the, your end goal and what you want to uh, see in your future state processes to, to help kind of identify what is the best fit for you. Do you want everything in one? Do you want to maybe look at some best of breeds? Do you want kind of a hybrid? So we'll help you through that. Um, and although you may think of an ERP project as uh, mainly being about technology, it's really the people. So who and the process, how you actually um, are uh, that serve as the foundation of this project right the technology is arguably the easy part it's really changing your processes and policies and ensuring that you kind of really look at your roles and responsibilities within your departments to really set up a really good foundation to build that implementation configuration on um, so when you start thinking about revamping future state processes policies and sometimes roles and responsibilities, we really want to kind of think about the end goal um, versus kind of what to do today. So now I will 
kick it over to Nina and I can certainly answer any questions um, once Nina's finished on anything that I went over. I know I went over pretty fast. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. And I'm just going to spend a couple minutes sharing the project approach with you and some of the things that we heard last week as we started um, the interviews and then we will open it up to some questions. So really why we're here today and why we're doing this project, as Tim mentioned earlier, um, there's really a desire for greater access to information and some of those operational efficiencies that you might not have right now due to some of the system limitations um, or some of the shadow systems and workarounds like using Excel or paper um, that might be required due to the current ERP. And so that is why we're doing this entire project to find some of those opportunities because at the end of the day, our goal is to have a more user-friendly system for everyone using it to reduce any of that manual data entry or redundancy or things stored or entered in multiple places. Um, we want to be able to procure an integrated solution where things talk to each other and are in one place for, for staff and throughout that process to really incorporate best practices into processes so that things can be more efficient. Um, so that at the end of the day, we can provide residents access to information and staff access to information through some sort of self-service portals um, with some of these modern capabilities and these ERPs. So that is the goal. Um, but two of the key benefits of an ERP system that I want to touch on is the integration piece and the citizen engagement piece. So from an integration perspective, we hear that some of the information is stored in different places or maybe dif difficult to reconcile between the various systems. And so looking forward, you really want that ERP to be the system of truth and having that one one stop shop, you know, having the record um, in one place and being able to see information in real time so that staff can spend more time acting on that information or analyzing the information to make decisions rather than searching for the information in multiple places. So that's one, one big outcome that we see with these new ERP systems. And the other is from a citizen perspective. You know, if, if someone calls and is requesting a service or some sort of information, we understand it can sometimes be a, a lengthy process to get, get that information. And so having some sort of custom, customer portal or self-service will allow citizens to see information um, so that's similar to staff they can get the information that they need when they need it. So those are some of the key outcomes and how we're going to get there with this project is we um, are assessing the technical infrastructure and conducting interviews with staff. As I mentioned, we were on site last week doing some interviews and we're doing the remainder of the interviews this week remotely so that we can understand what people are doing and what people are using and needing in the future so that we can develop some requirements that will go out with the RFP. So the request for proposal for a new ERP that will go out sometime this summer. Um, and then eventually we will get into vendor demonstrations and due diligence so that you can pick a uh, final vendor and solution that meets your needs. And so throughout this, we're, we're doing project management and change management every step of the way to make sure that people are um, well informed of the upcoming changes. So the project scope, as Natalie mentioned, it really encompasses the financial components and the HR components, as well as some other components like the community and economic development, um, we're talking risk management, we're talking the citizen and customer engagement and what that could look like. So these are all process areas that we're having interviews with the process owners and the departments and end users about. And just to share a couple of themes that we heard through our first set of interviews is that everyone has been very forthcoming and the group was so welcoming to us last week and shared a lot of good information about how they're doing things today and what they would like to see in the future. Um, people are super resourceful with what they have and making sure that people are getting paid and that they're getting their, their jobs done, even if there are some manual touch points. Um, but at the same time, people have been very forward thinking and People seem very excited about the change for the most part and have been asking good questions about how things could be done differently in the future. So we've been sharing that some of that information along 
the way through our discussions. So those are some of the, the positive themes that we've saw. And some of the other themes that we've seen is that there's quite a bit of paper-based processes and paper that is passed around um, the organization, which could be a potential risk, what we hope to reduce with the future ERP. Um, there's some workarounds due to some of the system limitations. And there's quite a bit of institutional knowledge, um, given that some people have been doing their, their processes for quite some time. And so they shared a lot of good information with us, but just some of the key themes to, to be aware of and we'll continue to share as we get more information from these interviews. And so in terms of next steps, as I mentioned, we're wrapping up interviews this week and we'll be developing requirements next month um, to go out with the RFP that will be distributed. We're aiming to distribute it this July. In the meantime, we'll be putting together a report of some of the things that we're finding and some of the associated opportunities to get you to start, kind of start thinking about what some of those changes might look like um, in preparation for your selection. So the goal is to have a vendor selected by the end of this year. We're aiming for um, November to have a selection and then to have the contract negotiations occurring in December. So that is our timeline to have this wrapped up by the end of the year. Um, last two slides, just to quickly mention that selection process is that once we get into the fall, we'll be reviewing responses and then working with the team to shortlist the top vendors to really lead into that final vendor selection. And we have tools and templates to really support this whole process, but we want to give your team the information that they need to support their final vendor selection. And in order to pick that best vendor, it really starts here. We're select, we want to make sure that you select the best fit for you, which is really why we're doing this discovery process right now. Um, we encourage that strong executive buy-in and strong project management. And that's why we're working closely with the project management team to ensure that things are moving in the right direction and that we're discussing some of those changes early on. And that commitment of quality resources to the project team, which you already have, as shown on this slide here. So you can see the, the project committee that's been very involved in getting this up off the ground running. Um, and should you have any questions along the way, please go to them or Tim and Samantha, who are a project manager or project administrator, or myself as the Plant Moran project manager. So we're really excited to be working with this team here. Um, and it's a very exciting project. So I'll open it up for questions or Tim, if you have any additions um, to add. Thank you, Nina and Natalie. Are there any questions around the table that you'd like to ask? So my questions may be a little premature. Um, as far as like a software we're looking for or a package we're looking for, are we, this is all call out based, correct? That we're looking at? Nina, do you want to address that one? Yes. So most of the vendors that we're seeing in the marketplace right now are offering cloud-based solutions. Um, we used, a couple years ago, the answer would have been very different, but now we see majority, if not all, of our recent responses from vendors being cloud-based. So yes, that is the direction we are, we are looking towards in today's marketplace. So are we looking at, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Are we looking at uh, a SaaS or PaaS software as a service or platform as a service? Yes, they are software as a service for the most part um, nowadays where you are um, paying for that implementation in the first year and then that ongoing um, software fees beyond that. Um, and I know this will probably be in the RFP when it goes out. What about uh, support after the fact? So I'm pretty sure they're gonna do like a lift and shift or is it gonna be a complete rebuild? with our system, since our systems are so old, would this be like brand new or would it be a lift and shift? Natalie, do you wanna provide some insight on that from the technical side? Yeah, so since this is, and as if you can kind of think about your phone, right? How many um, iPhone versions, if you have an iPhone you've had in the last 10 years, you could kind of think of an ERP in the same way that, you know, 
they're upgrading constantly, especially with the cloud, you know, quarterly, annually. So what you have today is going to be completely different than what you would see in a newer modern ERP system today. So I would say that this is a completely re complete re-implementation. It would not be an upgrade or lift and shift. And really, I think that's going to um, allow you all to kind of rethink what makes the most sense for you today and even in the future, kind of reevaluate your process because a lot of times our clients are constrained by older systems and the way they do things and it's not necessarily the most efficient. Um, and I would say that Nina, I, I agree. I'd say in the last couple of years, we haven't seen any vendors um, propose a non-cloud or vendor hosted solution. They are all cloud or vendor hosted. Okay. So vendor hosted, I mean, we wouldn't have to worry about um, the support after all of this is complete, because I know that's yeah. a that's so, that's part of the hardest mm -hmm. part. One, I mean, we can work with the contractor yeah. to actually help us build the software and everything, but um, as far as implementing the the support for it, would that fall on us, or yeah. would it is that what we're looking for? That's a great question. With the cloud solutions, for the most part, a lot of those managed services that they're going to provide are going to shift from, you know, before that would be on the city, managing a data center, you know, managing updates and all that. That really will be shifted to the vendor. However, there is kind of a long list of managed services that some vendors include in their package. Some vendors charge more for. Some vendors. Um, give you the option to, to take more in house. So that's actually a very detailed part of the RFP where we'll get down to really what each vendor proposes, what would be included in the price that they are proposing so that we can get an idea of what um, would be your responsibility versus theirs. Um, and one last question. I'm sorry if I'm overburdening you guys with these. Um, so Tim, what is our process for like our auth auth authentication? Is it right now username and password? We, are we looking at extending that with the new software? We're definitely keeping them username and password, or using like a. We're looking. Well, we, in many cases, we're already pushing multi-factor authentication. Okay. So you know, in our Google implementation, for example, I encourage users to use two-factor authentication. We've brought out ways to get signed in with your phone or keys or on those natures. But right. you know, realistically, I can only bring the users to that point, right? If they choose not to use it, I've got some challenges with that particular aspect of it. But the systems we have today, as far as the financial systems go, they don't even offer that capability. And so that's yet another security component, I think, that we're shooting for. Okay. I'll stop there. It's fine. It's good. Well, good yeah, you have... Alderman Robinson has more knowledge than the rest That's of right. us. That's right. That's right. Keep question. on going. Go for it. We're letting <laughs> you. Okay. We're just, we're just listening. So, I mean, one big question that I have is, are we are we thinking of an exit plan? Because with this being cloud based, <clears throat> some of the things we're running with the company I work for, um, we put all the energy into getting everything to the cloud, but we had no plan of getting it out if something happened. We have to have a back, you know, a back out plan. Are, are we? thinking of that process also, some kind of exit plan in case something goes, you know, horribly wrong with this? You want me to take that one? Yeah. Yeah, Natalie. So obviously they have, right, there's a disaster recovery plan that, and, and process that these vendors are going to provide. Um, and that's more of like, right, if, if there is a, a decision to kind of back out, whatever that may look like, um, how do we get that? How do we get that data out? Um, and is it safe? However, you're right. I, I think that even in the private sector, um, there hasn't been necessarily this idea of having to back out data from the cloud because it is supposed to be a solution that is continually growing with you and you're continually upgrading. And so there hasn't necessarily been that need to, you know, completely end the contract or get that data out. So. I don't have the best answer for you. It is something that we're talking with vendors about. Um, it's a portion of the the contract that we will, you know, build in. But in you know, kind of hypothetically, I think that that's something that you know we'll definitely want to make sure we talk with the selected vendor on what that plan is and make sure we feel we feel comfortable with it. Realistically, we already have problems with that, even with our in-house systems. Mm -hmm. You know, when we moved from the previous financial system ten years ago, twelve years ago, to the one we have. The idea was to pick up a lot of the historical information and drop it on a new system. 
that became a real stumbling block during that implementation. Correct. Ended up being a, a large part of the cost. And then when that information got moved, it was kind of jumbled up. So, and so you, the, you bring up another question I have then, um, legacy data. So currently, are the data we have right now, with this being a complete rewrite, brand new, so they're pretty much going to be starting from scratch, are we thinking of how to get that legacy data in? Because sometimes that does not match up. And if we're not doing a lift and shift, that means we either are ham jamming at ourselves, or they have to script that to kind of come in at least a way that we can manage. Yeah, certainly that is part of what we're trying to examine as we go through the process of selecting a piece of software. Is how far back do you need to retain mm -hmm. and how are we going to retain that? So most of those questions are yet to be answered, quite honestly, but it is, in fact, part of what we plan to examine. Also keep in mind who owns the data, because if we are using them for their service, sometimes they like to take ownership of it, and that's where that exit plan kind of comes into play. Right. Um, if, it's, if it's lying on their servers, they think they have ownership of it. And I'm just using that for an example because we ran through that problem before. I understand. Thank you. So I have a question about the actual implementation process since it is a t it's going to be totally new. Mm -hmm. So um, will Plant Moran still continue to be part of our consultant or once we select the vendor, they bow out? Because, I mean, you almost would have to like maybe keep you keep the old one going until you're sure the new one is really working, right? Correct. Because, I mean, you can't, I mean, we've got to pay people, we've got to be right. able to process water Typically bills. Typically you would run parallel, that's how we, yeah. Okay. Yes, and right now we're contracted to work with the city through the selection and the contract negotiations and helping through that process but part of our proposal was to discuss um, how we could potentially support the implementation um, once we get to that point. So, Just a recommendation, possibly. kind of have some liquid or fluid deadlines. Don't stick to real hard deadlines because it, it kind of you know, throws, you, throws you out there. The, the contractor will try to get everything up into that deadline even though the, the versioning may change or the need may change and it allows you to throw in some different um, uh, project things that you may need for that particular item. If we if we stick to a hard deadline, they're going to just build up to that deadline and won't change anything, and then they're going to call it a versioning that you have to pay for an upgrade for. That's why we have you on the council. <laughs> <laughs> on the committee. <laughs> it's just it's from experience. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have dark nights over that. <laughs> <laughs> Questions? Comments? <laughs> Looks like that's it. All right, thank you. Thank everyone. you very much. Appreciate it. Yeah. Exciting yeah. stuff. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anything else, Tim? Nope. That's it. All right, on to the next. Another exciting, fun topic downtown. Michael and Jack. <laughs> Let me get your presentation up. Is that pointer over? <laughs> I don't know, Tim. The TV cameras just kicked on. They didn't for yours, but they did for this. <laughs> 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 All right, good evening, Mayor and City Council. Um, exciting tonight, as, as mentioned, to discuss the downtown improvements and an update for everyone tonight. Um, I do have some quick introductions. We have uh, Jack Collin, um, you know, the, ch the chamber um, uh, secured the funding for this project and was the one who applied for this grant. And so they are a partner with the City of Rock Island. And Jack will be doing some of this presentation here later as well. So I wanted to introduce Jack. And then we also have some representatives from Veenster and Kim, Jason McKenzie, and Solani uh, Sheth. She's from Streamline Architects. So. I um, also have Mike Kane, who's the city engineer. We have all put in some time in, in getting to this point. And so I wanted to have them here tonight in case there's any specific questions for um, any of us. Um, 
and uh, we'll, we'll get started. So um, we wanted to discuss an update, and so what, what are we talking about tonight? We want to update council on the improvements. We want to hopefully get council support for the direction of the design. Um, council approval for the contract for design and engineering services. So tonight at the regular council meeting, we do have an agenda item on the uh, regular agenda for approval of the contract that we're discussing tonight. Um, again, we want to be very um, specific that what we're showing you tonight is not the final product. It could change varying on the public input that we receive going forward. We'll show you a project timeline and, and part of that project timeline is public input, not only public, but city council will have the final approval on these designs and concepts. So um, this is these are what you're seeing tonight and, and, and on this slide here is, is a rendering done by Beanster and Kim. But it's again, it's not it's not the final. It, it's it's not it's just something to look at what could what could look like. Um, so that's why I have preliminary in red. Um, uh, so we're we're not, we're not seeking the approval of the final designs tonight. So this is the project timeline. I know it's kind of small print, but it's you know it, it goes over this year and into next year, and um, we're hoping to have the construction start in February, March timeframe of this time next year. So um, there's a lot of work to be done in between then, um, including, as I mentioned before, public input. Um, we'll have design meetings. Again, they'll come back to the council in June for, for final approval. Uh, is there any, any questions so far? I just, yes, yeah, so we don't get too far into it, so I don't forget. Sorry about that, Mike. But so as I'm looking at the project timeline on 619 or approximately thereabouts, city council approves final design concepts, and then it's roughly, you know, we're looking at six months. What What is the, can you explain the design concepts versus the, the final drawings, and, and why is there such a big lapse, and why is there such a big time, you know, frame there? Yeah, and I could bring up Jason, but I mean, once we have an idea of the project's area, what is going to be included in the project, I mean, we could mention the things that's in this presentation tonight, and the council may not want to do that street or do a dog park or whatever we have in here. And so we, it, it takes a lot of time to complete all the necessary surveying, all the, uh, I mean, just, there's a lot that goes into it. Environmental impacts we have to, we have to submit to, I mean, with, with grant funding, federal funding, there's just, there's a lot of steps. Um, in, environmental could take three months to get approval of the project area that we're talking. And we're also in a downtown historic area now, which adds to those time frames. So. So I guess my question would be, so if there's concepts that are already out there, is, can't some of that work be done now, or does that have to wait until after that June, that June time here? You're talking about different, you know, you, you brought up different challenges, right? Or those things that can be, it, I guess I'm just, that just seems like a huge chunk of time here. I just kind of wonder if there's more of a streamlined approach. I mean, um, you're, you're saying do a portion of the work now that may be able to be completed and yeah then like you know environmental stuff I mean you, you have an idea basically you're going to know that based on concepts and preliminary stuff I mean obviously everything is subject to change as we all know but I'm just kind of wondering is that is that some is some of that stuff is it possible to get some of that going at an earlier time I'm just kind of looking at the that seems like a big chunk of time there to me yeah. When do you do the engineering? Is that from the June to the December? Is the engineering part of that in there? Correct. So yeah, that's once, a big once we piece have the final it. plan. Engineering takes a while. It does. Yep. Okay. But again, we also we also hope to put this all in one one scope, one project, and we would bid it as alternates. Um, so if if we didn't want to do the dog park or dog park bids came in too high, we would be able to separate that from the project. Okay, thanks for clarifying. Mm -hmm. But this date can shift up instead of... It could shift up, correct. All right, thank you. Didn't mean to interrupt you. No, that's okay. So when we talk about the scope, um, the grant was submitted with 18th Street um, from 1st to 3rd Avenue. The area shown in red is the 1st um, Avenue project that we've already uh, uh, been to council. We it went, I think it came a meeting or two ago with the approval of IMEG for the uh, engineering and has been in the works, it's in our CIP. We're hoping it will be on a fall IDOT letting for construction in late 2024 or um, 
a con with a construction start of probably spring of 25. So this, this would be about a year behind of our downtown project. Um, the area that's in the, 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 the diagonal hatched area, that is an area that back in 2020, um, they were, the TIF funds were being allocated and we had to get these allocated for certain projects. And at that time, um, Public Works was given approval to move forward with the design um, this was before the QC Chamber and the Downtown Partnership and everyone else um, came on board and we went with a, a much grander plan, I'll call it, for lack of better words. But we, we moved forward because we thought we needed to get those TIF funds spent. And so we, we more or less have this area already, already designed um, through Veenster and Kim, which is why we've also selected Veenster and Kim, essentially. Um, the, again, the, the whole dashed area or hatched area is, is, com is completed. Now, granted, that could change based on the public input that we get going forward. And so there'll be, there'll be some changes to what's already done. So we could have went out and bid that project already, but at, at this point, it will need some modifications. How much was it back then when you bid it? <laughs> to do the estimate yeah. or the construction estimate? Yeah, construction. So um, just um, the construction Nothing's estimate. Nothing's gone down. <laughs> oh, no, it has not gone down. Um, that area, uh, we estimated around three and a half million. Okay. Yeah, um, maybe two and a half. I'd have to go back and look. The what you're seeing in yellow tonight, um, including the the green section for the dog park and arts alley, is about seven point three million. Mike, I'll also just uh, remind you that we have an alliance, not a partnership. Davenport's got the partnership, buddy. I'm, I'm sorry, Downtown Alliance. And that's why Jack's here, because he's been involved in those discussions more so than I have. And so when we get to that, that part of it, he's gonna cover that. So I, I do apologize for that error. Um, just to talk a little bit about why this area was chosen. Um, and again, it's, it's not a final, it doesn't have to be final, it could, it could vary. Um, but again, 18th Street, we chose that. I think most people think of this as the core of the downtown. Um, it's kind of the gateway from First Avenue, Schriebert Park entrance attaches to 18th Street. Um, obviously the pedestrian mall has been a topic of this whole downtown conversation for uh, since the beginning. Um, and it's old, it's, you know, it's a 50 years old and you know, things don't last forever. They need, they need you know, modernizing, and so that's why we're considering that area. Arts Alley was part of the grant that was specific, kind of separate from the overall bigger $3 million grant, so that's why that's been included. Um, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself, but, and, and all, a lot of these things were from previous public input, input and the 2015 downtown um, uh, plan that was, that was discussed and had lots of public input around that plan. The alley that's shown um, there is is been an alley that Public Works has been trying to get completed for uh, years. It has poor drainage, the street floods out the Dumarche parking area. Um, there's you know there's po possible potential development there, future development plan possibly there in the future. So, um, and again tying into that dog park area would would make a, a significant impact for that for that area there. Um, any questions on, on the scope? Real, yes, a little bit, and whether it's the right time or not. Everything in, you talk about is street reconstruction. Is this sidewalks also? Is this yeah, building I, face to building face? I shouldn't assume. So it's this complete reconstruction, building face to building face. Everything you think about in the downtown that we've, that we've mentioned before. So streetscaping, new, new lighting, new trees, new, um, new pavement, new utilities, water, sewer, storm sewer. Those will all be completed and, and replaced with, with this construction. Where the yellow is, wherever the place where the yellow Correct. is, is, yep. is that. So the streetscaping and everything is included. And, and where the red is too, but it's just yeah, different, yeah, different yeah, it's a different year. contract and we, mm -hmm. or a different deal. And everything that we plan for the yellow will tie in with the red. So even though there are going to be different engineers, different could be different contractors, the same plan would be implemented for both both areas. Yeah. A question, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, Judith. Did you uh, just to follow up, clarify. So that part that was already done, the 18th Street portion, so that's also street reconstruction? Yes. Yep, we're, we're not proposing any resurfacings or, um, you know, at one time when we first looked at this, we were trying to save save money or, or, or just allocate the only, um, allocate the only 
uh, enough funds to only do what was needed and so we looked at maybe just leaving the street in place and just doing improvements behind the curb with new trees and sidewalks and they just didn't make any sense it's it's old infrastructure and all needs replaced and so yeah we're, we're looking at total street reconstruction and in real quick which is great um Maybe this is farther in detail than you have gotten or need to talk about, but like, are, the, are we widening the sidewalks for the cafe seating type of situation when we do that? Yes, that? Okay, I'm sorry, right. I don't mean to. Down, down the other question well. came up is the alleys downtown, and maybe this does the city own the alleys? Yes. So the city owns all the alleys downtown? It's all city right away. City right away, but they own them? We, we own the alleys. We own the alleys, because mm -hmm. sometimes you can have an easement and right away on it, it's private property, but we there's public property. Correct. In the alleys okay yeah and again the, the only ones that we're proposing now for improvement are the two alleys shown in in addition our salary yeah no that's fine i just was curious we'd love to do all of them but there's just not enough funding to no do but in the future and, and everything else no absolutely just and the, the question may come up but any any area that we're reconstructing reconstructing even in the alleys we would look to improve the lighting in those alleys as well so it's not just road reconstruction it's correct. let's make this once again streetscaping even in alleys so to speak Yes. So, are, yes, go ahead. Are we to understand that, that, that those alleys were chosen because of a drainage or because of access Did, or what? You're talking about the Dumarche area? South Alley between 2nd and 3rd Avenue, and then the East West Alley between 20th and 21st Street next to the dog park. I didn't hear, your first, I didn't hear the actual question. Were they chosen because of those specific alleys? Were they chosen because of drainage or? Yeah, the. the 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 alley next to the dog park between 20 and 21st street that was that was chosen because of lack of drainage there's no storm sewer in that area it holds in the center it's basically an unimproved alley it's um, a seal coat it's not even a concrete alley um, so it, uh, it it needs some big improvements every time we have a big rain the whole Dumarche parking lot looks like a lake um, just because there's no there's no storm sewer there but specifically that north south south alley because i know that there are some commercial accesses through that alley the, and how would those be adversely or would they be adversely impacted during the uh, uh repair or revamping of, of those alleys everybody would be impacted with this yeah. project i'm just i'm just there's there's no way around it Gotta do it when i was with the city of moline i oversaw their downtown improvements for three phases of that fifth avenue in downtown moline it's one of the biggest problems but you know, at, um, at the end of the day, they see the end result, and uh, you know it, it's it's definitely worth it. But there'll there'll be impacts. We'll try to minimize them as best we can. We always try to do that. Enough notices with, before construction begins. You know, ongoing notices while the, the construction is um, in you know going on. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of these areas will be shut down. There won't won't be access. And the reason to to shut them down is to get them done quicker. And minimize the the amount of time they're they're uh, impacted cost. So it may be done blocks at a time. So 18th Street would probably be done from first to second Avenue. That'd be one phase, and then you know second to third and so on. But um, we wouldn't go in there and shut the entire downtown down. Are we also looking at alleys adjacent to the new federal courthouse, or is that going is that an impacted area? So you can see the 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 area um, west of 18th Street. That's not on 3rd Avenue area. We, we, we took it to the west on 3rd Avenue to kind of incorporate the, the federal building area, kind of ties in our new parking lot, construction, sidewalks. Um, that, that's the reason for that. I mean, we know there's other areas in the downtown that needed to be done, and we're looking at a, um, a plan to you know fund those and prioritize those areas. Um, and it's, you know, again, there's a lot of areas that need done in the downtown. But um, that's, a, that's a future discussion, and it's going to take some future funding. Okay. Thank a you. A lot of future funding. <laughs> yeah. A lot. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Sorry, Mike. You can go ahead, then. That's okay. So with that, um, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Jack. He's going to talk about some of the previous public input that's been done that he's been involved in, and uh, he'll cover the next few slides. If you have any questions for me, I'll, also, I'll be right here for questions. So. Great. Good evening, everyone. Mike, thank you um, for 
inviting me to co-present tonight. I think this is a good sign of our, our developing partnership uh, between the Rock Island Downtown Alliance and the City of Rock Island. Um, I am pleased to be here on behalf of the Downtown Alliance. And uh, as Mike said, uh, we have a very exciting opportunity in front of us. Uh, not only do these proposed capital improvements um, have the chance to create safe and dependable infrastructure in the core of our downtown, we're also talking about making dramatic uh, enhancements to public spaces in the core of downtown. And doing this, uh, we believe, will lead to or encourage more private investment in our downtown, uh, as well as improve overall quality of life and add to civic pride for the city of Rock Island. Uh, next slide, thank you. Uh, another exciting piece of this project is the chance to implement a lot of public input um, that's been made over the past decade, um, not only in local plans, but also in regional economic plans, um, as well as input from downtown groups, including the Downtown Steering Committee, uh, and now and moving forward, the Rock Island Downtown Alliance. As you can see, you know, namely the 2015 Downtown Revitalization Plan, um, there were a lot of specific uh, directions and, and recommendations uh, from the public made into that plan that are relevant still today. Um, so very exciting that we have the funding secured uh, to bring a lot of those recommendations to life. And one of the recommendations that was on that previous page uh, was to consider converting empty parcels at the corner of 3rd Avenue and 21st Street into green space. And, excuse me, uh, how do you go back? Oh, this, there we go, appreciate it. So as I said, one of the recommendations in the 2015 downtown plan was to convert areas in 3rd and 21st into green space. Better yet, we have an opportunity in front of us to convert a vacant parcel into a uh, destination, uh, a dog park. Um, this opportunity came up, uh, if you recall, a uh, private uh, company, Illinois Casualty Company, the building with the, the shiny orange dome there in the right part of your screen, uh, owns the majority of that parcel uh, and offered uh, to donate it to the city uh, for development of a dog park, as well as up to $100,000 in matching funds for the development of that uh, amenity. Uh, the city of Rock Island does own um, a piece of that green space that's on the south side uh, of that area that's directly abuts the alleyway. And so with the current proposal, you know, um, a lot of elements that you would see in a typical dog park. So. We're talking gate and fencing, shade shelters and benches, dog waste bag stations and trash receptacles, uh, but also a lot of exciting elements that you don't see in dog parks, uh, at least in the Quad Cities. So uh, turf grass surface uh, would be very uh, unique. Uh, string lights uh, across the dog park just to enhance that overall lighting. Uh, camera for streaming as well as monitoring purposes. Uh, great signage, uh, what's been proposed, uh, a dog-themed mural on one of the adjacent buildings that would be working with uh, property owners there. Uh, in addition, you can see on the east eastern part of the parcel, it's overgrown with grass and there's no, there's no actual sidewalk or curb or parking spaces. So this project would enhance the streetscape in that area as well to mirror the adjacent properties that have the proper curb and, and parking parking facilities. Uh, in addition, as you can, you can see on this, on this picture, the alleyway that Mike referenced uh, south of the dog park would be, would be reconstructed as well. In addition to the drainage issues, we're seeing a lot of private investment in this area, and so it's, it's also to support that private investment on 20th, 20th Street, but also in the area around the dog park. And we see this as being a, an opportunity to create a welcoming pedestrian thoroughfare between those two parts of the downtown. So some of you, you know, may be wondering about the impact uh, of the dog park here. Uh, for one, 
This creates a dog park in the central part of the city. So the, the next closest dog park is in the southwest corner of the city, about seven miles from the downtown. Uh, and if you live downtown or on the hilltop or in Broadway, you know that there are a lot of dog owners in that, you know, directly around the downtown. And so we believe this would bring a lot of foot traffic. Um, we also think that the elements that are being proposed make this a really unique amenity and destination for not only the residents of Rock Island, but the entire Quad Cities. There is not a turf grass dog park facility, uh, and we think that it would you know, bring some additional foot traffic and, and be able to highlight some of the adjacent businesses and, and, and buildings as well. And happy to answer more questions about specific projects and pieces of them at the conclusion of the presentation. Arts Alley, uh, another exciting project and initiative we've been working on with Quad City Arts, the Arts Commission, and the adjacent building owners. Again, these renderings are preliminary. This is not, these are not what the murals are going to look like. It's not what a potential temporary rentable fender stall would look like. These are uh, renderings just to give folks an idea of what could be in this space. If you're not familiar, Arts Alley, 1700 block of 2nd Avenue, right next to Quad City Arts, Miss Bermani's, as well as Icons. It was created in 1994 by the city as a form of infill development after a building was demolished. So it is much wider than your typical alleyway downtown. And the reason is there used to be a building in its place. So the cre city created Arts Alley as this colorful gateway between the downtown business district and the riverfront. And it you know, there's been some improvements made over the past few decades, but uh, we believe this project really has the potential to, to make it that shining destination that it could be uh, and a tourist attraction. Uh, and the state agreed that was, this was the state tourism attraction um, application that we, that we put in. So major elements of this project include large scale murals on both buildings. As I said, we've been working with the adjacent building owners uh, throughout the process and will continue to do so working with Quad City Arts and the Arts Commission to develop a call uh, for artists and specific mural themes for that space. String lighting uh, as well through the space. Enhanced lighting is a major priority of the building owners as well, just a priority for us throughout the downtown. Enhance that safety uh, and that vibrancy through lighting at night. Uh, in addition to those pieces, we've talked about having uh, frames for local, local interchangeable art. So there are some frames that are closer to the ground level uh, in there, as you can see on the west side or left part of the alleyway. At the Arts Commission meeting last week, there was a great idea that was brought up. Potentially, the winners of the Chalk Art Fest every year, those winners could have their pieces uh, put into these frames for the year as another incentive to get more artists engaged in the Chalk Fest, which happens at Schwieber Park. So great, just an, another example of how getting that public input, working with the Arts Commission has generated some good ideas uh, for this project. We see there being an opportunity to have dedicated entertainment performance space in this alley, uh, as well as the idea of having these temporary rentable vendor stalls for local artists, entrepreneurs, business owners uh, to participate in pop-up programs at Arts Alley, whether it's like a holiday bazaar or other opportunities um, to program Arts Alley and, its, and the space. Uh, in addition, with this space being pedestrian friendly and that gateway between the downtown and the riverfront, we'd be looking at having attractive closures or, or bollards on both ends of the alley uh, just to maintain that, that pedestrian safety um, and would be removable if we're bringing in, you know, if there's a band that needs to unload or there's possibly a food truck or another um, need for vehicular access. Um, Wondering if you're wondering about the impact of an arts alley or arts in general or public art, um, one statistic that I think is interesting is that according to Americans for the Arts, 68% of U.S. tourism is driven by the arts and cultural tourists, uh, according to Americans for the Arts, spend nearly twice as much uh, as other tourists. So uh, we see this as a great opportunity uh, to bring in some, not only more residents downtown, uh, tourists, and again, be a source for civic pride in the city of Rock Island. <clears throat> the pedestrian mall. So as, as Mike said, uh, this is really the core centerpiece of the proposed downtown capital improvements with everything else radiating from it. And 
So the proposal here is to create uh, an entirely new block. We talked about underground infrastructure, which is obviously very important. Uh, the above ground infrastructure uh, is important as well. And what we're looking at here is a proposal to create a shared street or festival street concept. So as Mayor mentioned, very wide sidewalks here. 20, we're talking 25 to 30 foot wide sidewalks. No curb, so it's the same level as the roadway. Uh, and two lanes of traffic on the road uh, are for the roadway. Um, separating the sidewalks and the roadway would be bollards um, so that there is some separation from the vehicles as well as uh, uh, the pedestrian area. We believe this prioritizes pedestrian uh, foot traffic that we want to see downtown. Uh, at the same time, it, it enhances accessibility in the core of downtown and opens up this block for uh, maintenance vehicles, for emergency vehicles, uh, and really enables us to, to provide some better um, maintenance and, and response to, to this alleyway. One of the pieces that I'm most excited about uh, are those wide sidewalks <laughs> for the opportunity uh, for business retention, streetscape beautification, business attraction through dedicated outdoor dining uh, structures and spaces. So we have an opportunity to create a uniformly designed dining structure that we could see throughout downtown and beyond. Um, that's one of the really exciting parts about this grant, uh, or excuse me, these downtown uh, projects in general, is not just on this block, but we're looking to be able to provide uh, these dining uh, structures to established restaurants uh, throughout the downtown. Having that uniform look, again, is a signal to pedestrians or visitors to the downtown. Once they see that structure and they see it elsewhere, they immediately know this place has outdoor dining. It brings that traffic uh, towards certain pockets or areas of downtown. And if we're going to be pumping you know, a lot of money into this block and the surrounding area, this is an opportunity to really give it um, that fresh look, that modernization that we're talking about. Um, and part of this is still rebounding and recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and so helping and supporting businesses that have survived uh, the pandemic um, is a big piece of this. So it's, it's extra marketing for those businesses as well as um, an enhanced footprint uh, for those businesses with that, with that outdoor dining. And Jack, and to interrupt, but there would be no parking on that street. Correct? Yes, thank you. Uh, great point. There would not, with this proposal, there would not be parking. Um, that is something that's been talked about uh, in various discussions uh, over the past. Could there be areas for short-term parking zones? Could part of the block be reserved for short-term parking? You know, something that the restaurants experienced throughout the, over the course of the pandemic is an increase in carryout. Uh, and, and delivery services, so DoorDash and Grubhub and things like that. Um, in fact, some, some candid feedback that we got uh, during just conversations with, with restaurant owners on this block was that, you know, for delivery drivers who weren't familiar with our business and they, maybe they had a new delivery job during the pandemic, they didn't know how to find us because they couldn't drive <laughs> down that street. Uh, and so parking will be something that we need to discuss. There is a public lot that is just on the west end uh, of this block. Um, there's also street parking uh, on the east end. So th there are places to park for folks to go inside, pick up, carry out. Um, but yes, definitely not included uh, in the initial proposals. Just to keep the traffic flow going. Again, we're wanting to maintain this as a pedestrian friendly street. Um, and also have the opportunity to easily shut this street down. So when I, m I mentioned street closures that were attractive or bollards for Arts Alley, we'd be looking at a similar concept for this block. Uh, this historically was the block where you know, festivals and exciting events and entertainment happened in downtown Rock Island. Make no mistake about this plan, we, we still want to maintain the ability and the opportunity to, to, to program this space. And the importance is having the ability to shut shut it down. So um, say for a weekly farmer's market, uh, as an example, you could shut this down uh, for a few hours on, uh, on a Saturday morning um, and reopen it to traffic uh, as needed. Can I ask a quick question? So what is the need to allow vehicles to go through if they can't park? Because wouldn't that cause some more issues with people trying to stop to get deliveries from restaurants and everything? With that being just a two-lane road, would that cause 
you know, issues with allowing vehicles through there? Yeah, Mike may have an answer here too. Again, traffic flow was important, but the enhanced accessibility for the maintenance and the emergency vehicles were really the important pieces. And then the, the width of the sidewalks. So if we do parking, it cuts down on those sidewalks that we wanted to reserve for that. Again, that- I, I get that, yep. I get that. I'm just, I'm just not understanding. It's like they're, we're, we're doing a drive-through because they can't stop. They can just drive through. They still have to park somewhere to either mm -hmm. visit any of those. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. I, just bringing up a thought. Could be short-term parking explored. Yeah, we, we did look at short-term parking or, or parking on both sides. We had four or five different concepts that this was back when the steering committee was, was together, um, re represented in a, in a public meeting. And um, most of it was businesses who would have been impacted the most at that meeting. And the, the overall consensus that we were gathering was that they wanted even sidewalks. Um, it, it, you know, some, a business that was on the north side felt that they were losing um, sidewalk space for the outdoor dining and the south side felt like they weren't getting enough or they were being short, I mean, so vice versa. So, and, and again, as what Jack mentioned earlier, the, the amount of spaces that we could really fit in there in that space anyway is, is pretty limited. We looked at kind of a turnoff there um, on the south side by the uh, uh, Woolworth building, what, um, the Starcrest. Star, Starcrest building. But again, it, it would only accommodate about two or three spots. So by the time you do that and lose the sidewalk space, um, it's, is, is it really worth it? I, I've seen this before like this, that it really is helpful if, if you have elderly people and you want to pick them up at the door front, mm -hmm. that someone could drive down and park there to pick up elderly or handicapped people. Uh, they do stop long enough to do that, but then of course then move on. And so what it gives, the, it, it, if you want, you want to say ADA accessibility, a little easier uh, to be able to do that. We, well, we and also, I think for people doing the outdoor dining, I mean the last thing I want to do when I'm dining outdoors is be sitting next to a parked car. <laughs> you know, so I'm, I'm totally for no parking. Yeah, and, um, and it kind of goes back to what Jack had mentioned already too. Emergency services right now, it's difficult to get in there. I mean, you've got a stage, you've got other obstacles in that area. You also, um, it's for a public work standpoint, for just for maintenance of snow plowing, street sweeping, all those items that we do in a, other, on other downtown streets, it's, it's, it's more difficult there with not being able to get through that area, so. How wide is that area? How wide? Yeah, I mean, you um, talk about 25 feet each side. Front and to I, front. And I look at putting a street through the middle of there how are you going to have I, I the availability don't. for two cars and 50 There's, feet? No, I'm sorry. It, it, no, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty wide. I don't have that yeah, measurement right, right now, Gosh. but. Um, okay, 60 so feet. So that's. I'm so if sorry. it's, I was going to say 60. <laughs> Okay, 60 minus 24 wasn't 25. Which way. <laughs> it wasn't working. Yeah. The area to the west of the plaza larger in that picture because you could kind of see how two lanes plus the sidewalk would. Yeah. Oh. Uh, which area? Tied, that one, the tied. The actual right picture. Here? Yep. Yeah. Oh. yeah. They're tied together. We could, I think. could probably do it from the computer, maybe? Yeah, I was curious. But north of there, it's two lanes plus parking. And yeah. Yes. You the parking out. You'd kind oh, of get personally, a I think it. it's a. Uh, that's that is the best way to redesign that down there, and I think what you guys have planned is, is awesome. So yeah. The other piece of it is the alleyway that Mike referenced during the, present, the beginning of the presentation that connects 2nd Avenue and 3rd Avenue, the alleyway that's just off of the pedestrian mall. Again, another opportunity to create this welcoming pedestrian thoroughfare and a connector between the 2nd and 3rd Avenue retail corridors. And so enhancing the lighting, the look and feel of this space. You walk on 18th, it's gonna be a similar vibe, and then in that alleyway over to 3rd Avenue. It, again, it's for that continuity sake of just creating that, that, that same uh, unique look and feel uh, in the core of the downtown. So, I just wanna clarify for everybody. So what you're saying for the pedestrian mall, this is pretty much a final design? No. 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 This is uh, okay. this is being proposed. Yeah, that, this is what we would be looking at proposed. This is what previous public input has led us to. Um, but like I said, it could change. 
I think I said at the beginning, I think it's, it balances the wants and the needs to have a pedestrian friendly space, again, with the want and the need to have enhanced access accessibility, not only for the emergency and the maintenance vehicles, but also accessibility for business patrons. And so um, that's where we see this as a, as a win-win. Agreed. Once again, devil's the detail, and, and I've talked to Mike about this before, but um, conduit and everything else underground, it, it, you know, assuming you wanted to add something, if we wanted to add sound downtown, music, that you could string cables downtown, you know, and, and add speakers and have music if you wished or whatever. But, you know, once again, those are relatively inexpensive things to do up front, just empty conduit. So uh, I have a quick question, Jack. In, sorry. Those, and those street, those street lights, I'm sorry. those street lights as they do now have electrical yeah. power, right? And so obviously we would want electrical hookups in this street and any other streets that were yeah, if you have music or anything else, you're going to want to have a place to plug in and do things or uh, that sort of thing. The other would be, uh, I would like to see is to have uh, uh, free, if you call Wi-Fi down there. Accessibility. Tim, I, I knew Tim would get a reaction. <laughs> what? But uh, we've, had, we've had it in the past and we turned it off, but we've had okay. free Wi-Fi. A lot of downtowns oh, that offer that amenity subject. is to have <laughs> Wi-Fi. Hot spots. It's a whole other discussion. And also part of this plan, too, would be EV charging stations in certain areas. Um, we were hoping to partner with Metrolink at our parking lot here, but the time, the amount of time with the construction currently going there, we didn't have enough time to implement that. But they, they received grant funding to um, install charging stations, and so they would, uh, we would look to partner with them on this project to put them somewhere. You know, per personally, I, I like this idea. My, my question would be, when I was talking with people, I know the two restaurants wanted the street and the two bars there did not. So out of the four businesses right there, two are for it, two are against it. Um, and it's just, who are you gonna make mad is kind of what you're gonna do. Yeah, and I think the, the key there again is the ability to program, right? So when the want and the need is there to program it, shut it down for a concert, um, we will have the ability to do that. If we didn't with these improvements, I would say that would be a mistake. Um, but if you know, if we can, if the software can match the hardware, <laughs> in, ter in terms of just uh, planning for events and, and things of that nature, um, you know, that's something we just we need we need to do. Better than the snow fences back in the day. Yes. Put snow fences up back in yeah. the day. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Randy, Mike. So. Personally, I think this is great, and we've had many discussions about this, you know, obviously, and I, I do agree that for emergency services, it provides the best, and it's kind of an outdated model of what we had down there. Has there been any talk of, I know we talked about gating up the areas as far as for events, are we thinking a gate, a gate system, or maybe incorporating something kind of like we've had in the past where we've had some built-in gate so, you know, like we have some gates that we use. Obviously, these would be a little bit bigger. And I don't know what what is the what's the thought process? Is there? Yeah, that, we've looked at both. Mm -hmm. um, currently, the gates that were utilized down there are down at Public Works. So I don't know if we'd go back to that same setup. Well, I just didn't know if there was something that we would. You know how we always have the district gates, and it had the district, and it was kind of a nice thing that closed off an area. I didn't know if that was something that we could look at too during events that would be more I don't I don't know how you talked about bollards too didn't you talk about yeah, bollards? We looked at even um, hydraulic removable bollards that go up oh, and down okay perfect um, are we gonna maintain the purple light look or are we gonna get some new lights down there I'm just monkeying with you <laughs> is there some purple lights on the, on the wow. <laughs> um, yeah. so my can I I'd like to switch gears a little bit if if you guys don't mind going back to the dog park just a quick question on that sure. who is who will be maintaining the dog park it's a great question uh, and I think it, we between the downtown Alliance and the city we have a great opportunity to, to hash that out um, you know we've discussed potentially an enhanced <laughs> services contract between the downtown Alliance and the city um, if the dog cart park comes to fruition, is that one of the public spaces that is under the um, under the responsibilities of the Downtown Alliance? It could be, it's something we've talked about. Um, 
Just trying to get one of the benefits. What your thought is on one it. of the benefits of the turf grass is that while it it is uh, a little bit more expensive on the front end, um, it is it requires less maintenance over time, um, and it has odor and bacteria fight. At least the product that we've been exploring has odor and bacteria fighters in the material, um, and so it would need to be depending on use. Uh, flushed, you know, a few times per year, um, which could be a great opportunity for our, our fire department to have an event at the dog park and, and bring <laughs> families and, and folks down to, to see the fire truck in action. So I, I agree with all that, and I understand the maintenance side of that. Um, as far as obviously dog waste, people littering, throwing garbage. I mean, I just just kind of curious. Is that is that something you guys would give them some thought to? And who? That's the maintenance side of it. I think I'm more addressing than. So it doesn't become, if you know, not everybody's a responsible pet owner, right? So some people go in and they'll just leave, let their dogs do their business and leave it, and then maybe they decide, or they walk by and people start throwing garbage in it. I guess I want to know how are we addressing that? Some may have seen uh, in Modern Woodman's parking lot the former bank uh, building space um, after it was built, not not in the original infrastructure. There there was there was a uh, trash bag receptacle or tra dog waste bags and a trash receptacle added to that parking lot because folks were bringing their dogs there and some of them weren't cleaning up after themselves. We would have the same pieces in the, in the dog park. Again, the maintenance question uh, comes back to who is maintaining it um, and we haven't fully fleshed, the, fleshed those details out. No pun intended. <laughs> One of my concerns, too, because we have limited park slash public works um, staff to maintain, and we already have so many parks to maintain. Um, so that's a big concern. Because it almost has to be picked up daily if you want to keep a really nice looking park, dog mm -hmm. park. You just can't say, oh, we'll pick it up once a week. That's not Yeah, work, so. and if there are dog owners on council, you know, you go to a dog park, not every dog owner just <laughs> lets their dog do their thing and, and not clean up, right? So um, obviously it can happen. In the ideal and so world, you, right. need, you need the controls in place to, to, to make sure it's maintained and, and, and cleaned and, and all that jazz. Um, one of the goals of the Downtown Alliance really aligns with the goals um, of this project is to enhance public spaces, encourage private investment, and to improve overall quality of life benefit of having the Downtown Alliance is that enhanced maintenance, beautification, potential for it downtown. And again, that's why it's been discussed that potentially the Alliance could could be the ones that are charged with maintaining the, the dog park. Um, downtown Davenport, for example, they, the Downtown Davenport Partnership has a separate cleaning services contract with the city to, to clean the sky bridge, to maintain the sky bridge, to, to tackle the um, parking garages and things of that nature, Kaiser Slaughter and Square. So, um, you know, Arts Alley, Dog Park, uh, if you could imagine, could potentially become uh, places that the Downtown Alliance focuses on on more of that daily basis. Uh, not only for cleaning and maintenance, but for programming purposes as well. Davenport's got a dog park downtown too. Yeah, so getting back to the total redo of the Ped Mall, I, I like that your focus is on the ability to program because that's essential, because you gotta, you gotta have events, festivals, concerts, whatever, to bring people there, and we need to have another space besides Schriebert Park. Yep. Well, and you should be able to connect them then, mm -hmm. have well, an event yeah. at Schriebert well, Park and, of course, and bring it up. And First Avenue's going on a diet here in a year or two to even help make that uh, more pedestrian friendly. That's just what I was gonna say. I mean, one lane in each direction on first, it aligns ex well with what we're doing here. When I talk about the downtown improvements, I always bring up the First Avenue project because I see it as an extension. Although it may not be happening at the same time, it's an extension of those improvements because you have to think about it big picture all together. So. so out of that 7.3 million that you had expressed, how much is the First Avenue project? The, because we have 7 million, this is 7.3, and I've, I've seen pictures of that ped mall before. I mean, it is destroyed under there. I mean, you guys are gonna get into some crazy stuff when, when you guys get under there. Yeah, the First Avenue project is 
about three and a half million dollars. Okay. And we have a, a grant from the surface, a surface transportation block grant for 2.6 million of that. Yeah. So the 800 plus thousand remaining would be is, is in our capital improvement plan to be funded with motor fuel tax. Okay. Very good. Again, just talking about the more money we can use for the downtown, the better it can be, the more services we can provide, and the better off our city is. Those are separate. Yeah. Yep. yeah, and that's what I was yeah. trying to yep. clarify so for everybody, for, think about, yeah. for our friends at the meeting. So what, what Jack was just going to say, so you're looking at over $10 million of investment in the downtown here over the next three year, two or three years. Yep. Plus the parking facility. Yeah, plus the parking parking ramp. Yep. Very Huge. Good. Well, in addition to all of the fabulous uh, comments that my colleagues on City Council have been saying, this is... Uh, really exciting project. I just wanted to highlight this council uh, repeatedly calls for more strategic thinking in the city's actions, um, more allowing plans and budgets to inform the actions that the city makes. And I have been just totally impressed and blown away by the use of planning that has informed the scope of this project. I'm delighted to see so many, you know, nine separate recommendations from the 2015 downtown revitalization plan included in the scope of this. Uh, I mean, we got plans going back from the Rock Island vision. The, I mean, it, this is a perfect use of strategic planning and why we do these planning documents. So. I'm glad that they are no longer sitting on a shelf collecting dust. Uh, kudos to Public Works, CED, Jack, and the team at the Alliance, and us up on City Council. If I can pat ourselves on the back, uh, this is really great stuff, and you have my full support. Good. All right, do you want to continue on down? You got some more of the presentation or not? Oh, I think no, it's just funding sources. Funding sources. Yeah. I said, at least there's more science, science slides here. <laughs> Shouldn't come to a, come as a surprise to anyone. Um, one and a half million from the downtown TIF district, federal ARPA, the city's allocation, two and a half million. Uh, our two grants that the chamber and city were co-applicants on, the, the state of Illinois rebuild downtowns and main streets capital grant program and the tourism attraction and festivals grant program. Uh, in addition, private donations, the bulk of it being offered as the matching funds for the downtown dog park, um, bringing us to close to $7.4 million for the project. Great. No cost overruns. <laughs> That's great. Very good. Well thought out. Appreciate it. Everybody's input. Anybody have any other questions? So, well, I know it wasn't addressed, but it was part of the 2015 plan lighting up the WHBH tower. <laughs> so, I'm just curious, who, who pays for that lighting? <laughs> it's, it's, curr it's currently in our, our plan to do that as part of this project. And it's, we have estimated around $50,000. A year? No, I no. mean the cost of the lighting. City would, oh, city would, put, it in, city would put it up. Right. And, that, and the station would maybe pay for the electricity. Oh, okay. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, it's yeah, part would... of the project, but who pays for the lighting services? That... We're, we're in conversations with WHBF and the general manager and their engineer um, for seeing if it is feasible. We hope that this project could come to fruition as this you know beacon of light <laughs> um, in, in Rock Island. We think it would be a great addition to this project, um, but we are still exploring the feasibility of um, whether it can happen. Any questions? What we have, do have a uh, downtown uh, uh, alliance uh, member here, our board member here. John Chow. Thank you, John. John. Yep. Thank you for coming. Any other questions, comments? It's exciting. Yeah. Move to adjourn. There is a meeting tomorrow night, correct? Yeah, our first Downtown Alliance board meeting uh, is tomorrow from 3.30 to 5.30 at Illinois Casualty Company. And um, Todd, as a reminder, is, is on the board uh, with, with 12 other members. So public is invited to attend the event. Um, there's a sign-in if you do come. Uh, sign-in at the front desk of Illinois Casualty Company. 
And uh, there's a virtual meeting link as well that, that Todd has. Oh. Okay. Anything else on this topic? Not. I'd entertain a motion to adjourn. I'll move. Second. Move to second. I assume no discussion on that. Roll call, please. Alder Person Poulos. Aye. Healy. Aye. Robinson. Aye. Hertz. Aye. Gilbert. Aye. Swanson. Aye. 